I am delighted to welcome you to this event hosted by UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies and co-sponsored by the Murray Gallinson San Diego Israel Initiative. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair of Israel Studies at UCLA. 25 years ago, on the evening of Saturday, November the 4th, 1995, an Israeli Jewish extremist, Yigal Amir, murdered the Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin. The assassination of Rabin shocked Israelis and Jews around the world. Uh, it was a deeply traumatic event for Israel, a major tragedy for the state of Israel, for the Jewish people, and ultimately for the peace process. We organized this event to mark this um, very sad milestone, to look back at that day, to assess its significance from the perspective of a quarter of a century later, and to consider what lessons it holds for us today, particularly regarding the incendiary atmosphere that preceded the assassination, when opponents of the Oslo peace process, opponents of territorial partition, um, vilified Rabin, demonized Rabin, calling him a liar, a traitor, a murderer, and even a Nazi. And this atmosphere was powerfully conveyed in the film Incitement, which won the Israeli Film Academy Award, the Afir Prize for Best Picture in, 19, in 2019. And I hope you've all had a chance to watch the film. Um, so to discuss this film and Rabin's assassination, we have um, two excellent speakers, which I'm very uh, happy to, to introduce. First, the director and co-writer of Incitement, Yaron Zilberman. Uh, he's also directed, co-written and produced the internationally acclaimed film, A Late Quartet, which is about a New York-based string quartet um, on their 25th anniversary and it starred Academy Award winners, Philip Seymour Hoffman and Christopher Walken. His first film was an award-winning documentary called Watermarks, which told the story of a, a Jewish sports club, uh, Hakua Vienna, um, and the uh, women swimmers who were reunited um, uh, after having been forced to escape from Vienna 65 years earlier. And he's currently in the post-production phase of a, a, a new uh, drama you may have heard about because it will be uh, coming to American TV screens as well, uh, Valley of Tears about the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Uh, so I'm delighted to welcome uh, Yaron Zilberman, and thank after you. we hear from, thank you, after we hear from Yaron, um, he will be joined by um, Yoram Perry, who is the uh, Abraham and K Jack K Chair of Israel Studies at the University of Maryland at College Park. He was also for a decade the director of the uh, Gildenhorn sorry, Institute for Israel Studies, and um, was previously the founder and former head of the Chaim Herzog Institute for Media, politics and society, and a professor of political sociology and communication at Tel Aviv University. He's the author of many books uh, in English, The Generals in the Cabinet Room, which was published by the US Institute of Peace, The Assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, uh, which he will be talking about, I'm sure, in our conversation today, which was published by Stanford University Press, and Between Battles and Ballots, Israel, the Israeli Military and Politics, which was published by Cambridge University Press. In addition to his illustrious academic career, uh, Professor Perry has also had an illustrious career as a journalist and political commentator in Israel. He was the editor-in-chief of the Israeli Daily Devar and was also a host of many TV and radio programs in Israel. In the early 1970s, when Golda Meir was prime minister, he was the spokesperson for the Israeli Labour Party, and he later became a political advisor to Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Um, so um, Professor Perry can talk uh, about uh, Rabin both on a personal level as well as, as an academic expert. Um, so I'm delighted to uh, welcome both our guests and to thank them for joining us. Um, each of them will, will talk for, make initial comments, and then I will uh, pose some questions and, and read questions from the audience. So please uh, go ahead and, and start sending us your questions, and we will have plenty of time to hear the answers to those questions. So without further ado, let me first of all turn over to Yaron Zilberman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dov. Thank you, UCLA, for inviting me to this um, 
sort of honor to speak uh, in, on such an occasion uh, in memory of Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, for me, it turned into making a movie about the assassination. Uh, I thought that was the angle. In, again, from my point of view as a, as a filmmaker, to discuss Rabin's, uh, Rabin's legacy even and Rabin's assassination and to really explore uh, by exploring what led to the assassination, um, you know, learn about Israel democracy, Israel society, um, you know, how can we move forward after such a horrific uh, event? Um, and, you know, questions, all questions that have to do with society in a way. Uh, so I initially, just as an introduction, 16 years ago, you want, wanted to make this movie and a friend of mine convinced me that it was too early. It was too close to the assassination and therefore Israelis will not be able to watch anything related because of the pain involved and also the rage and also all the open questions that were not yet you know, dealt uh, at full length. So I waited. And then, you know, years later, a producer, a friend of mine in Israel, because I reside in, I, I live in New York City uh, most of the time. Now I'm, I'm in Israel uh, in post-production, editing, finishing the last episodes of this TV show about Yom Kippur War. But, uh, and I'm speaking from a post-production facility. That's why it's a bit uh, on the dark side here. And um, so then, you know, he, he, said, he asked me, he said, you know, I want you to make a movie in Israel. What would bring you back to Israel to make a movie here? And my answer was, only one topic because he gave me many scripts and they were all great but I thought you know that's not for me to make you know that kind of move but then he said okay is is there a subject that I said yes Rob, Robin's assassination uh as we can see Israel and I would say that almost not worldwide but definitely in Israel and in the U.S. there's a major attack on democracy major major assassinating a prime minister in my view it's sort of the almost the highest degree of trying to kill democracy because prime minister represent democracy by the very basic element of each person vote and voting means you know you have like it's the equality it's the only equality in a country is that you know one one person one vote and the idea that we together select the leader to lead the country uh, and, and in that respect, killing him is killing that process, it's killing the democracy. So I thought, you know, that it's super urgent and we see every year it becomes even more urgent and more relevant, uh, this particular topic. So that's why I embarked on this project. And here we are, you know, it, it, it was screened last year. And just to tell you as a, you know, it could be an anecdote, but for me, it's not an anecdote. It's that on November 4th, uh, we are going to, you know, every year we have an event in Robin Square when where Robin was assassinated, and so it's an event honoring him, in a, in an event that honoring him, uh, and of course, um, you know, discussing Robin's legacy, and in this particular one, which is the 25 uh, anniversary, they're going to screen the movie um, Incitement in the square on 14 screens and that becomes the event. The event is for 25 years is the movie as a reflection, as a reflection and a way for all of us to reflect on what led to the assassination, what should never happen again. Uh, and the clue is in the name of the movie, the title in English, of course. Um, and that's that's my introduction. And thank you very much, Sean. I'm, I'm, um... It's really amazing that the film will be shown as the centerpiece of the of the commemoration, and I think that's a really important way to to mark the event. So, um, I'm ha I'm actually kind of happy to hear that that there's been a decision to do that. Um, Yo, I'm Perry. Thank you, Do, for inviting me, and I enjoy listening to you, Your Own. I'm you. very happy to hear that the movie will be shown in the square. Uh, because uh, it's, it's a great, great film. It's a very good one. And I saw it several times and I really enjoyed it. If the word enjoyment is the right one, yeah. watch it. The, 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 the film is very important for two reasons. Number one, it didn't add to my knowledge about the assassination, the background, 
and the repercussions. But out of nine, more or less nine million people who live in Israel today, a, a third of them either were born in Israel after the assassination or came, were immigrants and came to Israel. So three million people know nothing about the assassination. And it's so important to put it in front of them, bluntly in front of the face, particularly because uh, since the assassination, there was a process of indoctrination against the assassin, against the commemoration of Rabin, trying to, put, to make people forget about it. So, so many people really don't know the facts and it's so important to tell them what you and I know that it's obvious. Particularly about the religious element, I'll get to that in a second. Or maybe let me start with that right away. Following the assassination, a very few people discussed the role uh, of the rabbis in the incitement. So much so that even the uh, Shamgar Commission, the Commission of Inquiry, dealt only with, it, with, with the, the assassination itself and did not want to touch the political elements. So they didn't speak about incitement. They didn't mention the politicians from the right who caused that atmosphere in Israel and that definitely did not touch the role of the rabbis. So the second importance of the of significance of the film is not only to tell the story, but to say openly, publicly, bluntly, listen to that element, watch that role that rabbis played. And they played a major role. And it's important because of the, sec the next point that I want to, to mention, and that is what were the, what was the results of the assassination? The results of the assassination were three. Number one, the reason for the assassination was to stop the peace process. And that was very successful. Igal Amir was extremely successful in stopping the process of, of peace with Palestinians. Second, this is, the assassination ex, were, was, an, was an expression of the growing level of violence in Israeli society. And indeed the, the, the event in the evening, the, 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 in the public square, the, the, the title of that event was For Peace Against Violence. And not only that it ended with violence, since then the level of violence in Israel has increased dramatically. Uh, and third, the, the role of the rabbis that was not discussed so much then is now seen more and more and more in the process of the last 10 years of what I call religionization of Israeli society, the role of rabbis, the role of religion, uh, not, not so much as an intellectual moral phenomena, but more a political phenomena has grown. So these three elements, no peace, more violence, and religionization are the direct, direct outcomes of the assassination. It all started before the assassination was part of that tension within Israeli society. And, uh, and uh, it created even more, it, it continued these processes more and more. I published a book after 10 years of the assassination, unfortunately in Hebrew. I didn't publish it in English, called Yad Ish Ba'achiv, the uh, Rabin assassination and the, and the uh, cultural war in Israel. Uh, and there I described, that was 10 years after the assassination. And there I tried to explain the causes of the assassination, the story of the assassination, and the impact of the assassination on Israeli society. And what I saw there already is the beginning of a process where the force that they try to make people forget about it are becoming stronger than the forces that say, let's remember what happened. And indeed, we see today more and more of that, of that, uh, of that phenomenon. Today, for example, about a third of the Israelis do not believe that Igal Amir was the assassin. 
And if you ask people from the national religious camp, more than half of them say, no, he didn't, he, he didn't uh, assassinate Rabin. And there are lots of stories and, and conspiracy theories about the real cause for the assassination, including ridiculous ones. If a famous professor at Bar Ilan University spoke publicly a few months ago and spoke about it and said Rabin was not assassinated by Igal Amir, but by somebody else, who he knows who it is, who, who he was. So, so the, the, the forces that try to, to make people forget the, the event are stronger and stronger. And it's done because it serves the purposes of the people who were behind the incitement then. So what, what we see today, particularly in the last several years, and it becomes worse and worse, is a very, very dramatic similarity between the period then and the period today. Then you saw, you saw incitement against the peace camp, against the peace agreement, and against Rabin in particular. It came from the opposition. It came openly, directly from the extreme opposition and indirectly from the leg legitimate opposition. Netanyahu was a leader of that, of that group. Today, there is the same inc incitement against the same groups, those who believe in peace, the liberals in Israel, those who want to, to see Israel as part uh, living in peace in, in the Middle East, having a liberal, democratic, humanistic society, but today, this incitement comes not from the opposition. It, it comes from the top of the top of the top of the Israeli political system, from the government, from the prime minister. And he's using incitement. He's trying to put people one against the other to, 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 to weaken the liberal forces. The word left is not legitimate anymore in Israel. So I'm using the word liberals liberals, humanistic, Democrats. So the same situation that caused the assassination and was developed because of the assassination is now continued to develop and brings Israel further on towards the very negative pole that we, uh, that, uh, we, we see in these days and, when, and, and you see that in the demonstrations in the streets, which are not only because of the corona, but also because of the fear of so many Israelis, particularly young ones, about the future of Israeli democracy. So, so again, the, the, the film was done in the right time, and it, I hope that it will serve the right purpose. Thank you, Yoram. Um, can I just, um, just to follow up now and pose a question uh, to Yoram based upon what Yoram was just saying, um, you know, you, you, you said in your, in your comments you wanted to make a film about the Rabin assassination. And of course, there's lots of different angles you could have taken, but you um, chose to focus, and I, th I think, and based upon what Joram was saying, he would agree is that you focus on the issue of incitement. That, that instead of just depicting Yigal Amir as a kind of, you know, isolated individual or, or, or as a kind of deranged, you know, zealot, you, you focus on how this wider environment that he was embedded in shaped and ultimately in some ways gave permission for his actions, even if whether explicitly so or not. Do you agree with your, um, Professor Perry's point that Israeli, that in, in terms of how the assassination Rabin of Rabin is commemorated in Israel, that there has been this kind of evasion from this aspect of the assassination, specifically from the incitement, that, that instead of focusing on that, you know, for reason, for the political reasons, perhaps that Professor Perry was suggesting, that there hasn't been a reckoning, a serious kind of political or moral, or, or let alone legal reckoning in Israel with the incitement that preceded Rabin's assassination and the perpetrators of that is, would you agree with that? I agree 100%. If there were more percentage, I would add that too. I'll give you only two examples, which I think makes it clear. And they would both, to me, sound crazy. Uh, the first one, let's start in 1996, when the first election, Bibi Netanyahu wins the election. In this way, almost against all odds, eventually it's a very tight race with Shimon Peres. But Shimon Peres became the prime minister, sort of the you know, 
um, temporary prime minister for the inter interim uh, period. And then they, you know, we had election and Bibi Netanyahu won. I mean, the guy who was inciting at the head of the incitement, sort of, uh, uh, you know, leading that group becomes the prime minister, which is crazy. And now when you win election in Israel, I think it happens everywhere, you have sort of a, the first speech. It's a long speech where you talk about, you know, state of matter in the, in the, in the state and also thanking everybody. In that speech, he did not mention Rabin or the assassination, neither one. So the assassination did not happen. It's Huck Rabin did not, was not mentioned in a long converse, a speech when he just won the election because Rabin was assassinated. It's wild, it's crazy. Imagine that, that you have a situation like that. Um, so I think that means for me, just to uh, you know restate your arm, for me, it's already on the spot, the er erasing that event, the erasing the assassination and trying to distance you know, certain groups of people or, or, you know, individuals already started to distance themselves from the assassination. And you see that already on the spot, which is crazy. You know, just say something, say, oh, I, dis I disagree with, with Robin's uh, political views. I think he went in the wrong direction. However, a prime minister should never be assassinated. Nobody should get killed for their political opinions and otherwise, et cetera, et cetera, and talk to the people and explain how terrible it is, however it happened, and now we're gonna make a better country, etc. No, he did not mention his name or the event. That's number one. Second thing, now we move forward. Israel is celebrating 70 years. That's, that happens in um, 2018. We have a celebration and you have a minister of uh, education, very important role, of course, in society. And he decides for, to celebrate the 70 years for Israel. He decides that he's going to make some kind of a, um, a uh, wow, it's hard to describe what it is, but it's, it's, uh, it's a memory lane of Israel milestones so that students from all over Israel arrive to that location and they walk through milestones of Israel's uh, history. Guess what doesn't appear as an important milestone in Israel history? The assassination of Rabin is not mentioned. In November 1995, there was not, in 1995, there was no event, significant event uh, to mention in, 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 uh, in part of that sort of official. Who is the minister of uh, education at the time? It's Naftali Bennett, who is also the head of the uh, religious um, uh, sort of um, national Zionist party. This is really, extreme. Of course, people complained and then they changed it and adds, added something, but it just show you how profound the erasal of the memory of the assassination is engraved within that group that tries to erase it. I, for me, that's very sort of, cons, you know, concerning and shows the whole uh, movement. And the movie, one of the important roles of the movie was to try to set that history so people can, again, as a reference to what happened after you know years and years and years of research, interviewing everybody involved, including Igal Amir in jail, parents, friends, and you know, learning about the subject and showing what, what really happened. And you asked me, I'm sorry that I'm a bit long on that, but you asked about, you spoke about the fact that we chose to show Igal Amir as a not, a crazy sort of lunatic zealous. Uh, first of all, the main reason for that is because that's what I discovered. I spoke to him. I, you know, studied him and his behavior and his thoughts and ideas and personality. And the conclusion was that this is not the case, not the case at all. So if it's not the case, then even more interesting, what made him do it? And when you look at all the angles, I mean, of course, you need a perfect storm to get somebody to be able to shoot the prime minister in the back. But a major part, major key part to the reason why I did that was in plain, simple, all the incitement, which both from religious, but not only religious, by the way, religious, yes, rabbis, yes, especially those from the um, 
you know, so-called occupied territories or however you want to call it, the settlements, um, but not only. It was, came all the way from Bibi Netanyahu, which was the head of the opposition. And we, you have to, th there is a connection there. It's like the base, it's part of the base in a way of, of Bibi Netanyahu. So I just want to mention that for me, that's you know, the main picture that I discovered while working. Let me, add, let me please add just one sentence, what happened a few days ago. A minister in the cabinet, in the Israeli cabinet, a famous mm. female minister, the daughter of uh, Levi, said, yeah. Rabin is not my, it, it doesn't belong to me, it belongs to you. She meant it belongs to you, the leftists, the Ashkenazim, not to me, the, the young Israeli, Oriental Israeli. How can, a, not a minister, how can a person in Israel say, it's your, it's your game, it's your thing, not mine. Uh, and uh, she's, I'm sure that she will continue to be a minister, not, no harm will, 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 will cause her. So I wonder in, in terms of this kind of um, evasion uh, that you've both been talking about and, and the, 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 the uh, forgetting, willful forgetting, if you like, of the assassination and, and how it came about, is this a question of a kind of trauma that's too painful to revisit? Or is it perhaps, as you're suggesting, really about politics, really that these individuals Netanyahu and others do not want to address it and, and almost suppress the collective memory because of their own responsibility. It's not, it's not personal, it's a personal or personalities. It's a major conflict, the major conflict in Israeli society. The, the, the reason that we cannot solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not of the, because of the security elements, because of the territories, it's because of something much, much deeper. And that is the conflict or about the collective identity of Israeli society. And you have two camps. You have the camp of the left that tries to see Israel living in peace with its neighbors, trying to, be, to live, to be part of the family of nations, trying to be a modern, sophisticated, liberal society. And the other one, the nationalists who see the Jewish, traditional Jewish, extreme, extreme version of Jewish tradition as the leading force in Israeli society. In my book in Hebrew, I described the first one, I took American terms, metro and retro groups. The metro are those who see Israel as part of the West. The retro are the ones who see Israel as part of the old traditional religious conservative uh, uh, society. And, and, and the, the tension between these two groups was so high that each group could not envision a success of the other group. So when people on the right realized that Israel is going to make peace with the Palestinians, for them, it was the end of their vision about the Israeli collective identity. For example, very important uh, writers wrote that if there will be peace with Israel, between Israel and the Palestinians, all the Israelis will marry the Arabs and the Jewish people will disappear. Or others said that Israel will become part of Europe and will lose its, its, its identity. It's a repetition of the, of the debate that took place 2000 years ago between, the, between Jerusalem and Athens. Do we want to be Athens, part of the Western world, or do we want to keep our, our, our identity separated from everybody else? So, so the, that, that, caused, that caused the tension. And a wonderful expression which came out to me when I read the documents of the investigation of Igor Amir in the, in the police, that was 15 years ago. Uh, I saw that he to told his, the, 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 the policeman who interviewed him that he came to the, to the square in Tel Aviv and it was packed with Arabs. So I said to myself, 
how, how could he say that? After all, I, I was there. I, I didn't see any Arab there. Maybe there were a few, but I couldn't see them. They were Jews. And then I realized that for him, those who are willing to make peace with the Gentiles, with the Goyim, particularly the Arabs, are like Arabs. So he saw them as Arabs. And if they're Arabs, naturally you have to kill the Arabs because they are your enemies. That deep division between these two concepts continued since then. And therefore the ones who won after the assassination and continue to lead Israeli society, continue to lead it on, the, on, 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 the, on this basis. Now they are criticized, they are inciting against Israeli Palestinians, Israeli citizens from a Palestinian origin. Netanyahu is talking against them all the time. He didn't change his position. So, so, uh, so it, the, 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 the effort to make, to, 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 to forget the, the story of the nation is part of that process of, of socialization uh, of, the, of the younger generation in Israel, by the way, very successful, that they were wrong, Oslo, the people who signed the Oslo Agreement are criminals. And the Oslo Agreement is, is being called the, 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 criminal, the criminals of Oslo. Uh, so it's, so it's an, a very, very clear attempt to make people forget the assassination and the meaning of the, of the assassination and to support the forces that, were, that led to the assassination. So, Yuan, I'm thinking of in, in your film how the, the, you seem to make this point that Yoram was making in, in a number of kind of fairly subtle ways. I, rem I recall the, um, the clip that of David Grossman being interviewed, who mentioned, yeah. you know, when was peace, we will yeah. be able to deal with these existential issues. And, and, and a comment, I think, that Yigal Amir made about you want to live in a secular country like everybody else, we want a Jewish... So, uh, so uh, you, do you agree that, that there was this kind of, that it wasn't just about land for peace and Oslo, but rather a broader and ongoing battle for, you know, the soul of the nation, if you like, or what, what, what is that? They are interrelated, what you just said. Uh, again, not wanting to give up land has to do with a great vision of Israel being a more a religious country at the end of the of, of the day, this is it's the same vision. They're all together, and again, the, the identity as Israelis and you know being more religious Jews for this part of society, they mesh together. So I think yeah, it is. I, I agree all, again with Yoram on that that it's a clash of you know within society of our identity. Uh, how do you want to see this country? you know, what it should become. Do you yeah, agree with Yoram's point um, this, that in some ways Yigal Amir won? That in some ways, not only in terms of, you know, no, and, and the peace process, but I in know, this broader... I yeah, I, I'll, I'll tell you this. You know, for me, this is, I'm, I'm a filmmaker again, so I, I speak like a filmmaker, which means that for me, I cannot think of Yigal Amir winning because everybody lost in the country. This is, that's the way I look at it. By killing Rabin, he actually brought a disaster on Israel and also a big you know, shame on the Jewish people. So for me, in that regard, it's terrible. He did not win, he actually lost. If his cause is to you know, bring a beautiful Jewish person into a future, where Jews are, as we say, light to the goyim and all that expressions, which is his world, not my world. His world, actually, he, he, I think that he brought upon him a disaster. So that's what it is. But what, what he did succeed, absolutely, is by stopping the priest process, no question about that, uh, because you need leaders. That's what we know today, and everybody knows that. There's this argument always, if it's the leader or the people, you know, who is making peace here? Is the leader take the people to make peace or the people want peace and the leader is being elected to do that? This argument will be there forever. Uh, and the, always the answer is both. In this case, if you don't have a leader that's pushing the country towards a direction which has, uh, which, which calls for a change and change has 
pain for those who are not willing to change. So that, that you know, brought that kind of pain. And um, so I, I don't, at the end of the day, I think that he, he did not succeed. He actually is, has brought and still bringing uh, a disaster upon us. Look, this country is split. There's a lot of tension and violence, incitement everywhere. People are, you know, pushing for different directions, um, very opposite. And again, violence can erupt in every any moment. Um, I'm, cur I'm curious to know since that's, you met that's a disaster. Um, I'm curious to know since you met with him, and yeah. you and, and at the end of the film, it noted that he expressed no remorse. Yes. Um, does he though believe that his action? was does he believe he succeeded yeah so i did not meet him in person i met him through you know it's like a phone they speak to him in jail and i wanted to keep that distance so in these conversations that uh, my lead research is doing and i'm texting question and he's giving me answers um all this conversation he actually believes 100 that the act is justified it's logical and, and yeah, he thinks that he succeeded, absolutely. That's what he thinks. So um, we, I'm, I'm gonna turn to some of the questions uh, that we've been getting uh, from the audience now. And I wanna um, you know, start with maybe a question, uh, some of the questions that have come in about Yigal Amir himself and, um, and you know, the way he was depicted in this. And one, one question um, concerns uh, the impact of his, his military service in the idea on him. Um, and again, and I think it was very subtly done. Um, you know, I remember his mother saying, you know, you were a gentle and delicate boy. What happened to you in the army? And you included a clip of a, a former army buddy saying, you know, you, you brutalized Palestinians or what didn't use that terminology. Um, so the question is, you know, was, is that, is there, evidence to suggest that this was in fact the case, that, that Amir was somehow uh, radicalized or traumatized by his army service. Uh, as far as I know, this isn't something that's been really discussed much about in the context of the Rabin assassination. That's true. Uh, I never heard that before, by the way. Uh, now I'm making a, you know, a, a TV series, a 10 episode series about the Yom Kippur War and I'm really focused, like, it's, it's about the soldiers in battles in the north of Israel. Uh, and I've been, you know, living that for the past two years. And I would say that my conclusion is that everybody's traumatized by war. And, you know, by association, everybody's tra traumatized by being in a war zone. Uh, there's no question about that. The only question is how you respond to it. If you're very sort of strong emotionally and you know there's um you're composed etc cetera, etc cetera, we can talk about that forever then it's easier for you to go through that but if there's you know any childhood traumas associated with that you know there's a trigger that can really send you into a loop and so it's hard to know if Igal Amir in Galamir's experience did that i can tell you how he behaved he behaved like a what one would call a bully. So he was the first to enter houses of Palestinians to do, you know, searches. He was brutal. He was, uh, you know, breaking things that are not necessarily, you know, had like sadistic traits. Um, and that's happened. Now you can say, oh, wow, we're talking now about a sadist and he's horrible, blah, blah. but his commander, is the officer admired him. He thought he's like one of his best soldiers. So that kind of um, behavior was actually admired. Therefore, there's no question again that, that, that there is an, an impact, a negative impact on the fact that we have soldiers in places that, you know, these soldiers who are young people, they're 18, 19, 20 young people that are being, um, that acting in a like, super aggressive way that includes also shooting and sometimes killing and being in danger, being shot and being killed, of course. It's, it's both sides to that. There's no question, no question that there is an impact. Uh, and also on Igal Amir, again, I would not go as far as to say that that experience made him 
kill Rabbi, not at all, nothing to do with that. But that also was within him as part of the reason why he was able to operate a gun, felt comfortable with a gun, managed to infiltrate Rabin's circle in order to shoot Rabin. When he was infiltrated to pretend to be a bodyguard or to pretend to be a security service and being very calm about it in the middle of that you know, zone, it gave him a lot of uh, sort of ammunition in order to do the deed. But there's also, I'm sure, a, a, you know, these personal scars uh, because as we know, many people act in this situation very aggressive because they're scared, maybe acted in an aggressive way and then you have remorse. You find yourself to be a person that you not necessarily thought of yourself. There must be many things operating at the same time. So the answer is yes. And it's an angle, to be honest, that is fresh. Yes. And, and one of the other, another angle which um, you brought up in, uh, in, I think, in a sensitive way, without kind of psychoanalyzing Yigal Amir, but pointing to maybe the intersection between these kind of wider ideological religious influences upon him and his own biography was his Yemenite background and the, the, the kind of sense of marginalization within the settler community by virtue of being a Mizrahi Jew. Um, so, and I wonder, you know, how, how you kind of, the decision to, 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 to note that and to, to how that you think maybe played into this um, and, and also to, to Professor Perry on this, does this aspect, is this aspect, the kind of, you know, the intra-Jewish ethnic dimension, um, is this also part of what makes this assassination, what's, what's prevented or made it hard for Israeli society to really reckon with the assassination is because it touches also on um, this, uh, this uh, divide, uh, or historic at least, between Ashkenazi and the Mizrahi. So when people say, Rabin wasn't us, that's also, I mean, the minister you're mentioning also happens to be a Mizrahi Jew. Absolutely. There is a clear correlation between left and right, religious and seculars, Ashkenazim and Mizrahim, doves and hawks. It all goes together. And therefore, Israeli society, which was always divided society, there were always different groups in Israeli society, different tribes. But in the past, until 1967, it was a crisscross division. You could be belong to one group on one issue and to another group on another issue. Since then, it became very clear division between these two groups, which I described as, uh, as, uh, as I described it earlier. And, and if you are Mizrahi, don't forget that in, in the 80s, 80% 80 of the Mizrahi voted for Likud. Later on, it became 70%, but it was 80%. And today, the vast majority of those who are willing to annex the territories and to change the nature of Israeli society from a democracy to an autocracy are religious people. So this division between these two groups is very clear. And, but contrary to what Yaron spoke earlier about the impact of the military service on the individual, I don't think that these divisions which I describe are so crucial what is important is that they are being used by politicians. They are being used by politicians. The division between left and right, orthodox, orthodox and, 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 and seculars, uh, uh, um, Mizrahi and Ashkenazi wasn't so deep some, some years ago. It was used by politicians, particularly on the, le on the right, to create, to create that. If you take the Minister of Education, she, Minister of Culture, Miri Regev, now she took another position. She, she, was a, she was a colonel in the, in, the, in the army. She wanted to run, she, she was born in Morocco. Uh, she was a colonel in the army. She wanted to join politics. She planned to join the Labour Party. A friend of, of hers, who is a friend of mine, told her, don't go to the Labour Party, you, you won't be successful, go to the Likud. She went to the Likud and she became an extreme, extreme hawk extreme nationalist, he told her, I know you, Miri, these were not your positions uh, three, four years ago. But the major, the, 
flag that she is using is the deep split between Ashkenazim and Mizrahiim. So it is, manipula- it is manipulated. The same applies to religion. It is manipulated by politicians. It's, society could be less divided if different politicians will lead the way towards harmony and peace within ourselves and solidarity. It's a matter of, of leadership, but we really live in a period of, uh, of a um, lack, of pol- lack, lack, lack of real politician, lack, lack of leadership, lack of leadership. Um, one of the questions, just to uh, pick up on this, uh, Yaron, that came in from the audience is, um, you know, the, 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 the aspect of the story in the film where um, Yigal Amir's kind of would-be fiancé, um, you know, calls off the relationship, probably because of this Ashkenazi Mizrahi issue, her parents uh, didn't approve. And, 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 and was, this, was this true? I mean, the question asks, was this true? Was this, um, was this also part of this a kind of, you know, a kind of sexual melodrama going on at the same time? Um, and his mother, you know, who was kind of pointing out repeatedly that he would never be accepted by an Ashkenazi woman. Um, so, so maybe you feel something differently than you are in that this was and is perhaps still a, a, a salient issue, a salient social divide. Well, <clears throat> first of all, I would never take such liberty as to create such a story as one of the vectors, you know, leading to the assassination. I would never do that. That's totally irresponsible and against what I was trying to do. What I was trying to do is to research and use what I learned and to create this Galamir that was, you know, sort of the one that I perceived as, you know, how he thinks, acts, do, believes, what acted upon him. So I would never do something like that ever. Uh, you have that, this actually what happened. Uh, it was not so much on the, of, of course, yeah, there isn't a sexual thing because, you know, these are youngsters and, you know, 24 year old, da, da, da. But it was more about he wanted to marry her. There was an issue now of getting married, form a family. And then he felt, you know, again, the outsider. So I think that the, the what the uh, Mizrahi and Ashkenazi aspect acted upon him, you know, are, I would say two the two main things. The first is, yes, there is that feeling of, um, I would call that, you know, social injustice along the years. And you have, you know, sort of the frustration. And, and then you have, uh, with some good incitement, good old incitement, you have also hatred. And you have, you know, racism, which goes both sides, the racism from Ashkenazi tradition towards the Mizrahim. And now you have Mizrahim, a racist towards the Ashkenazim. It's exactly the same, just different way of to look at the same thing. All these are built up and yes, and then you can look at Rabin as a representative of the Ashkenazim who suppressed the Sfaradim. Therefore he is the enemy of the Sfaradim and he becomes again an evil person. And then shooting him also, you know, set the score on that one too. So yeah, you have that element, it's there. It's it's also psychologically, you know, it's the, it's the background. But you have another aspect of that issue, which is that there was a part of Igal Amir, which is simplistic, simplistic, I mean, basic in the way, in, in, in terms of trying to, you want to be a hero. You know, he was a smart guy uh, relatively speaking, uh, articulate a good student, law student at Bar Ilan University. So, you know, the, his brain works well. People were very impressed by his abilities. Um, in the, and I met people who said that he had a big sort of name in the community, wanting him to, to you know, help the, the uh, different communities and talk and guide young students, etc. So we're talking about somebody almost on the level of a leader within his community. Um, so I'm saying that, that this particular person being rejected creates an anomaly, like a dissonance that there's only one way, which is again, it's a childish way, but this, this is part of what uh, fuel our personalities 
is to prove his worthiness, that he's really great as his mother thinks he is, as really great as he finds himself to be. And so how come these people don't accept me, you know, in the Ashkenazi settlements? Why don't they let me become a leader? Why can't I marry that great girl who really want me? What's happening? She wants me, and then she has to say no at the end, and then she marry another guy. Guess what? An Ashkenazi, you know, that fits the type. Why am I not good enough? Because I have dark skin. And, and that's, I think, was also a major part pushing him emotionally to prove that he's a hero. He's bigger than them. They talk. They talk about, we need to kill Rabin. We need to kill Rabin. It's the only solution. But I'm not going to talk. I'm going to do because I'm better and I'm bigger. So it's like an ego, ego maniacal thing, uh, which also acted very strongly on him. And that's why for me, that means Rahim Ashkenazim, that was the effect. So it's, it, it, it worked on him in the sense of wanting to prove it be, to be better. And when he saw, and you see that in the movie, when he sees that after Baruch Goldstein massacre in Hebron, you see that after that massacre, there are rabbis, a well-known rabbis, important within the community. One of them is like a major Chabad uh, rabbi. And he would go and give a speech where he would praise the, you know, Baruch Goldstein who did the massacre. He would praise him as, an, as a tzaddik, as a big tzaddik, as a sort of the closest to God ever. Imagine for a young person who wants also to be accepted as something, you know, big and worthy and a hero. He sees that opportunity that with the gun, you can become one. I, I agree with everything that you said, Yaron, and you really were very capable in presenting the emotional, uh, the, uh, political, analytical development of, of the assassin, how he became such, uh, such a person, and how he, what brought him to be what he was and to, and, 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 to, and to kill the prime minister. But I want to remind you that during the weeks before the assassination, our colleague Ehud Sprintzak, who studied the radical right in Israel, came to Rabin and told him, and Rabin told me that himself, he told him there are 60,000 people in Israel who could kill you, who would be willing to kill you. So if, if you put the, the emphasis on one person, you miss the fact that there were very many who could do that. He was the one who, who was successful but others could have done it. it, it it's a social, it, it was a social phenomena that has to be studied, not only a particular case of one particular person. It also seems to me, um, and you mentioned this already in our discussion um, about it as a religious phenomenon. I mean, the, the fact that he felt the need um, to receive a religious legitimacy, to receive a kind of cash certificate, if you like, for the act that he planned from the rabbis. And that, and the film notes that he insists to this day that he did receive such a uh, permission. And, and that, you know, you go into some detail looking at the dinner of death and the different and the religious sources uh, for this justification. Um, is what is it was this an attempt to kind of is this an indictment of a much broader religious? National, national religious culture. I mean, much as we might blame rightly Amir, Yigal Amir for his act and not an entire community, we can't ignore, and I think the film is pointing to this, the fact that the ways in which the religious, Jewish religious tradition and religious sources have been interpreted, are being interpreted to justify and condone violence. Is there any change since, do you see, there's been any um, uh, grappling with the, the way in which Judaism was used or, or maybe abused, depending on your view, to, uh, to promote and justify this act. Yeah, I, I will say a few words that I think that uh, things, you, it's hard to say things has changed at all because now there's no threat to the settlements, the opposite. They're getting like funding, whatever they need uh, to build more and more and more settlements. 
So they, they're not threatened by any peace because there is no peace. There is no conversation. There's no any diplomacy going on between us and the Palestinians. So why would they be worried? So we, we don't know that. The question is, in a way, the, the theoretical question, if there will be a government that would be willing again to make peace, even by giving up land, how would they react? Would they react exactly the same as in 1990? four or five or differently that's that's uh, you know that's a guess that's a guess my guess exactly the same i know uh, after the but that's just my guess it's just my guess but we don't know because they're not threatened so there's no issue i can tell you when they left protest we are protesting okay big time these days uh violence is not part of that we don't talk about it. If somebody would say a word that you need to act in violence, meaning hurt the person, that immediately being, uh, you know, becoming an outsider, we, this is not part of the language. The language is the opposite. So protesting is great and important and everybody should exercise their right to protest. But the idea is the discourse has to be uh, a nonviolent discourse. and. I, you know, I, I I think because of the religious aspect, that's what religious brings. Religious can bring beautiful things, as we know, beautiful in terms of uh, you know community and feeling holy. And uh, you know, there's, there are many many element, beautiful element within uh, you know belief and religious and Judaism, etc. Not only Judaism, but there are, there are also these terrible aspects, and and part of it is because you have something, when you have something bigger than you, it can turn on you, on, an, on the negative. The negative is, you know, if God wants you to do something, then human beings don't count, right? And what does it mean to kill somebody if he's the enemy of the God? You know, there's no issue to kill them in that way. Of course, it's an extreme view of religious, but I'm just saying that re, that, that faith also brings with it these very strong emotions where somebody hurts say something bad about God, like we have in the case of Muhammad, we, you know, when you, when you insult uh, the Muslims uh, prophet, you, you can get killed because of these emotions. You know, with my heroes, if you'll say Beethoven was a terrible composer, I'm not gonna do anything but smile. You know, you, the, the, my heroes are not holy. They're not, there's no extra layer there for me to act in according to violence in order to stop somebody. It's just not in my dictionary because we don't have this, you know, saying something bigger. What we try to protect is democracy and democracy is the way we society function together in order for to maximize in a way uh, justice or, you know, for us to feel uh, that we're living in the, in the right way. So, yeah. So I, I see, yeah, there's a kind of critique of, uh, if you like, Jewish fundamentalism there, that the way in which, you know, the, the, the specific um, a, a, a line from Maimonides was interpreted literally to mean to warrant a death sentence. Yes. Yes. Um, has that, I mean, uh, Jan, do you, also, do you also see that this, you mentioned in your, in your opening comments that, that there's been this, increasing religionization of Israeli Jewish society in the, in the 25 years since Rabin's assassination. Um, does that, do you think that's also been accompanied then by this kind of, not just religionization, but a particular approach to religion, which is a kind of fundamentalism or, or what, we, what we call fundamentalism, or very literal reading of religious texts and applying these literal, this very literal reading of a religious, of, of, of a religious text to contemporary politics. Absolutely. There were, Judaism always had different interpretations. Uh, and the problem is that in the last 20 years, one interpretation became more and more dominant. There's an excellent book that was published uh, three years ago. Uh, I, I, I uh, analyze it and I wrote a review on that book in the latest issue of Israel Studies Review that explains the development of, of the political and, and theological thinking within the National Religious Party. And the two writers who wrote that show how in 40, 50, 60 years ago, 
the National Religious Party had two schools of thought. One was the humanitarian and the other one was the nationalistic and it dr dramatically changed. The, N the, N the, the National Religious Party in the past was a very soft and moderate uh, party. Today, not only today, it, it's, it's a matter of 30, 30, 40 years. They moved to the extreme nationalistic uh, pole. Uh, you, the the, the ultra-Orthodox, the ultra-Orthodox in Israel supported the left, the left-wing part, the parties. They were, they were against nationalism. They moved to the right. And the most dramatic change is the expression of particular individual rabbis. While during the period of rabbinic assassination, there were few who felt comfortable to talk against Arabs in such a way, Din Moster and Din Rodef, namely you can kill and he's a Jew if he is willing to, to, uh, to give parts of the Holy Land to, to, the, to the Arabs, but they didn't speak about it publicly. Uh, today, there are many more rabbis in official position, the rabbi of Tzfat, for example, or others who publicly speak for not letting Israeli Arabs or Muslims um, rent how, an apartment or rent a, or an Israeli student who comes from a Palestinian, a Palestinian community in Israel, not in the territories, not to let them live in your, in your neighborhood or let him, let him rent a, 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 a room in your apartment. And of extreme, extreme expressions and nothing, no one criticized that. I mean, those who criticize that read Haaretz. How many people read Haaretz? Uh, but but the, the public the public discourse it goes without any 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 reaction and again it is supported by the political leaders so this process of uh, religionization is a very negative process because it doesn't deal with concept of God and moral values but not at all it deals with nationalistic super nationalistic uh, and militaristic approaches. So I know we're out of time, but I want to just take the opportunity to ask one final question to both of you, because we are um, hosting this event here in the United States, uh, a week away from what is perhaps one of the most consequential American elections mm -hmm. in decades, at a time when Americans are more, in many ways, more polarized than ever before, when there's fighting in the streets between far right and left wing uh, activists, when democratic government, uh, militias are planning to take hostage democratic governors. So I wonder, you know, if you could say in just a, a few uh, sentences, what lesson you think this, the film, incitement and Rabin, the assassination of Rabin have for Americans? Is there something that Americans should learn or, or, or see in, in uh, this tragedy? Wow. One thing, one thing, which is go ahead, Yoro. No, I will. I want to say just to use this opportunity for a second to say that there are so many amazing questions in the chat room in the Q and A, and and this like great, great questions, and that will take about two hours to talk about at least. So I want to apologize that we're not getting to to answer them, but but thank you so much, everybody. Just by reading it, I really want to yeah. engage in a conversation. Um, I, I'll, I'll be very brief and then I'll let Yoram speak about it, um, about your question. I, there, there's no doubt that the American people can learn from the assassination, of course, you know, because you can see what incitement leads and you can also learn that or see that incitement became the tool of politicians. You have these Finkelsteins and all these people who are consult, I mean, he's no longer alive, but consultant to politicians and what they teach them. The ABC is very simple. Find an enemy, define an enemy, attack the enemy, make it so that if this enemy will, you know, be in power, it means that it's going to ruin you, crush you, end your way of living. That's the, that's the, the method. You do that method, you have a chance to win an election, even for Trump, which we know with all due respect, you know, we who live in New York, we know, you know, that he's no good. I'm sorry, whoever listens and feels otherwise. 
This is no good to the extreme. And so, but if you do that trick, if you do that trick and you do it, you know, first to your colleagues within a party and crushing all of them, and then you go on the major arena and you continue with that, you have a chance to become a president and here he is a president and using these tactics again and again and again and again. I think, you know, what you can learn that it brings eventually to assassination, it brings eventually to violence, it ignites violence, it fuels violence. And, and I think this is the biggest lesson. Unfortunately, nobody has been able now these days to stop that method. There's something very, you know, profound in terms of manipulating the public that works. Uh, and, but I hope that at some point, you know, the more liberal, or I would say liberal because in America it has different connotation um, than in Israel, but let's call it the, you know, those who want, yeah, liberal concepts, democracy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I hope they'll figure out how to start to win these elections and, you know, have the leadership uh, position without doing this incitement. How do you do it? Because it's so effective, it's horrible. So I think that's a major lesson and I'm just gonna stop with that and leave, let Yoram speak. Thank you. Two, two words, democracy and violence. We live in a terrible period of the development of, the, of, 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 the, of the humankind. We see in the last 10, 15 years, a decline of democratic values, the success of illiberal democracies, leaders, in, 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 in Hungary, in Poland, in other places, in Israel and in the United States who are conspiring against democratic values. So the, the, what, the, what the event, the terrible event that took place in Israel 25 years ago is a wonderful lesson, unfortunately, wonderful lesson, what can happen if you do not follow the democratic rules, you change policies in the, in, in, in the ballot box, you change, you change a, a prime minister in, in elections. You don't kill a prime minister. So democratic values is very important. And the second one is, is violence. And today, because of the uh, extreme change of our culture, because of the growing role of social media, violence became a very a wonderful thing. Everybody is, everybody is happy. Look at the languages people are using. Violent language brings people to violent actions. And therefore, we have to think twice, more than twice, about these two things, democracy and violence. Thank you, Yaron Perry, and thank you, Yaron Zilberman. I think it's become uh, very clear uh, to everyone that although um, we're talking about an event that took place a quarter of a century ago, the lessons of that, the, the relevance of Rabin's assassination, which was powerfully conveyed in the film and Simon is still even more relevant in many ways today than it's ever been. And, and I hope we can all learn that lesson. I want to thank you both for a really a fascinating discussion. I want to thank all our yeah. audience for joining us, for asking great questions. I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to get through many of them. We will try and uh, we will send uh, Yaron and Yaron the questions. They can, you can contact them. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, and uh, hope and please come and join us for future online events. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you thank very you. much. All the best. All the best.